Back in 1996, Chrysler introduced the third generation of its caravan, voyager, and town and country minivans with a ground-up redesign that embraced the much more rounded and jelly bean car styling of the 90s. Gone was any connection to its former K-Car roots, and it introduced new features that forced all of its competition to continue to play catch-up, just like they did with the first-gen minivans in 1984. This is a story of the third and later generations of the Plymouth Voyager, Chrysler Town & Country, and finally the Dodge Caravan, which managed to live the longest, finally ending production in 2020. This is my old car. From Chrysler. So if you haven't watched my earlier episode on the first and second generations of the Chrysler minivans, I have a link in the description to that one, where I talk about my own experience with a second gen 1994 caravan. Yeah, that experience was far from good, but mostly because it was just me wishing for a much more fun car to drive. We got a minivan because, like many new parents back then, it was the best type of vehicle to own. Later, my wife would get a third gen caravan, which she liked a lot, until a particular event occurred that I will mention later. The third generation of the Chrysler minivans, like I noted in my intro, shared nothing with its predecessors. Chrysler had already gotten a head start with much of the rest of their lineup prior to 1996 in regard to their new styling direction, the most notable being their LH sedans launched in 1993, which were a complete departure from the boxy sedans Chrysler had become far too well known for in the 80s. The trend continued with cars like the Dodge and Plymouth Neon, and Halo cars like the Dodge Viper. It was also soon to be a new era for Chrysler, becoming Daimler Chrysler in 1998, and the minivans were one of the key elements that encouraged Daimler to merge, and sadly later try to take over Chrysler. But well before cars like the Neon hit the market, the new minivan design at Chrysler began in 1990. It would end up being the most expensive new platform Chrysler had ever produced up to that point, at a cost of 2.8 billion US dollars. Back then, Ford was in the process of redesigning its Aerostar minivan, with a target date to reach production by 1994, and potentially could leap past Chrysler for the first time in the minivan market. Remember, kids in the backseat. General Motors had already introduced their Dustbuster vans by 1990, which although sold relatively well, were still being outsold by Chrysler's then older, boxy, and far less futuristic looking minivans. Toyota also had head start with its 1990 Previa, but like the GM vans, its polarizing looks, but also its unusual mid-engine design, weren't for everyone and Honda was behind most everybody else, not yet having any minivan available in 1990. As Chrysler was doing their market research on what potential buyers wanted in their next minivan, a popular request was the option of a driver's side sliding door. Early on, Chrysler saw this as a potential game changer, something where Ford's research surprisingly didn't match. The preceding arguments for sliding doors on both sides were brought to you courtesy of the new Dodge Caravan. But technically, Chrysler's third-gen minivans wouldn't be the first to offer a driver's side sliding door, as Nissan offered their Stanza wagon in the 1980s. Ah, the new 1986 Nissan Stanza wagon, the only wagon with dual sliding doors. They didn't call it a minivan, despite it having sliding doors on both sides. That may be because the Stanza wagon was much smaller, in fact too small to have a third row of seats. By 1990, Nissan redesigned the Stanza wagon to become the Access, that's with two X's instead of two C's, which did have a third row, but it was still smaller than the Chrysler minivans, and most people in the US likely never saw one, as sales were so poor that it only lasted one year, although Canadians had it for five more years. So although Chrysler couldn't officially lay claim to being the first minivan with a driver's side sliding door, when it came to market in 1996, it quickly became a major talking point among the automotive press, which to me at the time made it all the more surprising when I spotted new Caravan and Voyager models without the driver's side sliding door. That's because that door was an option, initially across multiple trim levels, although later the missing door was only on the base models. Those models also often didn't have tinted windows, so you could clearly see that they used the same window glass with or without a door. But at least Chrysler offered it, and its popularity caught Ford off guard and making them seriously regret not offering it on their new Windstar minivan that replaced the Aerostar for 1995. As a stopgap, in 1997, Ford increased the length of the driver's door and allowed the seat to fold forward to gain access to the rear seat from that door, although it really only worked for children to fit through. The additional sliding door didn't arrive until the Windstar's second generation released in the summer of 1998. Soon after that, Chrysler finally made a driver's side sliding door standard, as by then it was the overwhelmingly popular choice. Chrysler also made improvements to the rear seat design to make them easier to remove. The second and third row bench seats had wheels, which would pop into place when the seats were unlatched from the floor. My wife's caravan had this feature, and admittedly it was clever, 
but it still didn't address the biggest issue, which was still needing two people to lift the seat up and out of the car. The third gen was also engineered from the start to offer all-wheel drive as an option, and still maintain the same floor height as the front-wheel drive model. And although I said that this generation of the minivan was a ground-up redesign, it didn't mean they couldn't share parts with other models. Do the caravan's tail lamps look familiar? If so, then you also remember the first generation Dodge Durango, which used the same tail lamps. They also didn't change out the engines from the second gen minivans, at least for the V6 offerings, and they borrowed the 2.4 liter four cylinder from the Chrysler Cloud cars, the Stratus, Cirrus, and Breeze. I drive a Dodge Stratus! Which in the minivan offered almost the same performance and fuel economy as the V6s. The same minivan continued to be available in Europe, branded as the Chrysler Voyager, since the Dodge and Plymouth brands weren't marketed there but it looked like the Dodge Caravan, and it was offered with a 2.5 liter four-cylinder turbo diesel. This was the only engine that may have had a chance to be paired with a manual transmission for the minivan, as Chrysler debuted a concept in 1998 called the Voyager XG, which tried to compete, oddly enough, with more active outdoorsy crossovers. In addition to the manual, the XG also tried to look more sporty by sharing the same 17-inch wheels that were on the Plymouth Prowler, specifically the Prowler's front wheels, not its 20-inch rear wheels, but it never went beyond the concept. The third gen minivans also introduced more differences between the Dodge and Plymouth models. Dodge was marketed as a more up-level and sporty version. As I noted before, my wife had a third gen caravan, and it was a sport model, complete with a spoiler on the rear hatch. It was the last Dodge she ever owned, however, thanks to transmission failure before it reached 50,000 miles. I suspect some of you will leave comments that the same happened to you. The Voyager was marketed as the value model, which was the trend that Plymouth was following in the 90s. <laughs> Base models for both brands had gray plastic bumpers and door handles, but you could go all the way to the ES model on the Dodge that even offered leather seats. The town and country remained the highest trim offering, although at the start in 1996, the driver's side sliding door was optional. In 1999, Dodge experimented with an all-electric version of the caravan called the Epic, which stood for Electric-Powered Intra-Urban Commuter. Intended only as a lease vehicle for fleets in New York and California, the Epic's 28 12-volt batteries could only go about 80 miles on a single charge, at a time when there was no electric vehicle recharging network other than what the fleets installed on their own property. Only a few hundred were made before production ended in 2001, and most of the Epics were crushed at the end of their lease to avoid any future liability, just like GM did with its EV1 for the same reason. The third generation was also the final for the Plymouth Voyager, as the entire brand was being shut down during the 2000 model year. At that point, I figured it would be the end of the Voyager name, at least in North America. But with a 3-liter, 150-horsepower V6 engine, it has 36 times the cargo space of a Porsche 911. But instead, the Voyager name moved to the Chrysler brand and sold alongside the town and country. I found this an odd decision at the time, since the Chrysler brand was marketed as the upscale division, but now it was selling rebadged base model Voyagers. By 2001, Chrysler's competition started to catch up in terms of offerings and design. GM was a few years into their post-Dustbuster era vans, the Chevy Venture, Pontiac Montana, and Oldsmobile Silhouette, as was Ford with their second-gen Windstar. Sister division Mercury still had their Villager shared with a Nissan Quest. Toyota had gone more mainstream with their Toyota Sienna, and the Odyssey was becoming one of Honda's most popular models. In fact, my wife's caravan was ultimately replaced by an Odyssey. But Chrysler didn't want to mess too much with a good thing, and so their fourth generation minivans, which began development soon after the third gen went live in 1996, were a moderate rework of the third gen. Dodge Grand Caravan, the best minivan ever. Maintaining the same general shape and look as their predecessors, with the biggest visible changes being bigger grills, headlamps, and tail lamps. Sure, let's hide under the minivan. Great idea! But the fourth gen will probably best be known for a feature they introduced in 2004, called stow and go seating which is only available in the long wheelbase models. The idea of folding seats into the floor wasn't a new concept, as the Odyssey offered it for its third row. But for Chrysler, making it work for both the second and third row was a first for any minivan. The development cost around 400 million US dollars, not just for the seats themselves, but to rework the entire underside of the van to accommodate the folded seats. The only drawback was that all-wheel drive models were no longer available. Daddy just had to get a motorcycle, didn't he? Funny, huh? As there simply was no way to incorporate an all-wheel drive rear axle and driveline with the stowed seats. By 2008, the minivan market had significantly changed from its roots in the 1980s. Crossovers and SUVs had become far more popular, and both Ford and GM had abandoned minivans for the North American market. Chrysler themselves tried to gain a foothold into the crossover arena with the Pacifica, but it wasn't nearly as popular. 
With less competition, Chrysler introduced a fifth generation Grand Caravan in town and country, which had reverted back to a more boxy design, and also only offered a long wheelbase model, hence the name of the Dodge model. Hey, come on, let's go for a ride in the new Caravan! This time around, Chrysler needed to play catch up with its Japanese competitors by offering power windows in the second row sliding doors. It also offered more entertainment options for the second and third rows, and even the second row could be optioned to rotate so that it faced the third row. It would continue to be sold in Europe as the Chrysler Grand Voyager, and later was even marketed there under the Lancia brand. But the oddest addition to the mix was the Volkswagen Rutan, introduced in 2008 as a slightly rebodied caravan, thanks to a partnership between Daimler Chrysler and Volkswagen that began in 2005. It was a way for Volkswagen to re-enter the U.S. and Canadian minivan market without the cost of engineering a new model themselves. When parked alongside the caravan, the family resemblance wasn't hard to miss, so much of the buying public wasn't fooled. It didn't help that one of the most popular caravan features, the stow-and-go seats, weren't available on the Rutan from the factory, and instead just had the storage spaces where the seats would have folded into. And yet, the Rutan cost several thousand dollars more than a caravan. Yet despite these faults, the most bizarre thing Volkswagen did was to hire Brooks Shields to star in a mockumentary as well as follow-up commercials that suggested the introduction of the Rutan had triggered a new baby boom, or as they called it, the Rutan boom. I'm Brooke Shields, and this is the Rutan boom. Of course, they probably thought it would be hilarious, but today, knowing how poorly the Rutan sold, it's a bit cringing to watch now. Every day in our country, more and more people are having babies simply for German engineering. Is this the next baby boom? Yes. I suspect Brooke Shields isn't exactly proud of it. By 2012, after selling only 15,000 or less per year, Rutan production ended, and any remaining were sold over the next couple years as fleet models. What about the Rutan made you decide to have a baby? Uh, I'm sorry? Well, you're having this baby to get the minivan from Volkswagen, aren't you? <laughs> this is a hidden camera show? Back in the 80s and 90s, Chrysler really didn't have much concern that their Japanese competitors in the minivan segment would ever amount to a challenge. But as the fifth generation caravan made it to the 2010s, it became a common occurrence that both the Odyssey and Sienna outsold it. <laughs> hey Connor, have a little dignity buddy. In 2013, Chrysler began planning its replacement, although at that time only considering a new version of the town and country. By the mid-2010s, the Dodge division was trying to emphasize their role as Chrysler's performance brand, and the caravan didn't fit that image, so its days appeared numbered. Although honestly, the Dodge Journey, which they considered to be a replacement for the short wheelbase caravan, didn't fit the sporty image either. Beginning in 2016, Chrysler replaced the town and country with the Pacifica. Whoever drives it must be really handsome and a hunk. An all new minivan that was nothing like the short lived crossover that had the same name a decade earlier. How, how long have you been there? With the introduction of the Pacifica, Chrysler's plan was originally to have the caravan be discontinued that same year. But by then, the caravan, with its current generation having been in place for eight years, was still selling over 100,000 units a year. And with all the retooling and design costs of the fifth gen being fully paid for, Continued caravan sales simply meant more profit. As a result, the caravan lingered on until the 2020 model year, ranking it as the second longest running nameplate in Dodge's history, second only to the Charger, which is still in production as of the recording of this video in 2022. Although Chrysler brought back the Voyager name for a lower content version of the Pacifica, its minivan heyday is probably in the past. Thanks to millions of them being sold, this is one old car that has a better than average chance of still being seen on the road today. They will never be my favorite type of vehicle to drive, as I made clear in my first caravan episode. But based on the comments I have gotten, clearly I am in the minority when it comes to the love of minivans, especially the caravan. Hello. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, click the like button and subscribe to my channel. Look at that Coke. That barely fits in there. If you once owned a car from the 80s to mid-2000s that you rarely see today and would like it featured in a future episode, leave a reply in the comments or contact me at the email shown here. See you next time.